Hi, this is Frank Taylor with Nature at Your Door. Today I'm going to talk to you about plants that you can find growing outside your house, in your yard, or in a local park. These are plants that people refer to as weeds. And I don't call them weeds because every one has a particular name, a biology associated with it, and a fascinating history of historical use by either settlers to the USA or the uses by the indigenous peoples. The plant I'm gonna talk about today is called Pennsylvania bittercress. And it's actually a native. It's a winter annual that you can find growing vigorously right now in your yard. So I'm gonna talk about Pennsylvania bittercress, its biology, and some of its historical and current uses. So stay tuned. Right here in your backyard, you never know what you're gonna find. And here's the make this basic. It's exotic. Dogwoods are flowering. And I just took a couple swipes. Terrestrial environment. Uh, produce seed pollen. And it's. So let's do a close up now of the flowers and the leaves. I love looking at these plants that people disregard typically in their lawns and take a close look at their flowers and in themselves are really beautiful. So these flowers have four petals and four sepals and a very distinctive pistil. And the leaves have this pattern and are very, very recognizable if you look at these leaves. So flowers, seed pods, leaves, pretty easy plant I think to identify. So this is Pennsylvania bittercress, and it's characterized by these little flowers. And it's growing pretty prolifically around my yard today. And normally, I, do, I make it a rule not to pick any flowers that I'm observing or looking at, but this is one that is gonna get mowed over by a lawnmower pretty shortly here. Pennsylvania bittercress is a winter annual. You know, we're familiar with summer annuals, and then when we think about plants, that's usually what we think of, like a marigold. You plant the seeds in the spring, the seeds sprout as the weather warms up, they grow over the summer, they flower, and then in the fall, they produce seeds, and then they die out for the winter to repeat the cycle the next year. Well, this is a winter annual, and its seeds begin to sprout very often in late fall, and will green up some over the winter time, and then in the spring grow prolifically in the bright sun that's available to it before leaves come out in the trees. Many of the winter annuals, like chickweed is another great example of a winter annual, grow vigorously in this period of time in the spring and will seed and flower. And then by the time the leaves come out on the trees, their life cycle is pretty much done and they kind of disappear from your consciousness and from your view when you're walking outside. So let's go take a look at where you can find Pennsylvania bittercress. What does it look like and how do you identify it? So all I have to do is take a few steps and I can come right here by my patio and see Pennsylvania bittercress sprouting right now. And you can see it has these little white four-petaled flowers. One of the characteristics is these seed pods. This is in the mustard family, and seed pods like this are classic, classic mustard family features. And if you look at its leaves, they are deeply divided into little sections. They have a, a bunch of uh, smaller leaflets attached to a stem. The flowers, again, are relatively inconspicuous. Here's some wintercress just sprouting up right here. And you can see that it occurs all along this patio line all the way around. And also, here's one into the lawn itself. And you can see that it's outgrowing anything here right now. It's really, really growing vigorously. And again, you can check out springtime here. There's not a leaf yet on any of these trees. Another short walk up the side of my driveway. And here is a great specimen 
where you can see it without being affected by plants around it. And this is a typical place it grows. A lot of owners of greenhouses and nurseries complain about this plant in the spring because it'll pop up in this kind of nursery soil here from a previous planting. You can see that it has very, very long stems. You can see the development of these seed pods on the plant, cluster of leaves here. You can see I planted this grass species last fall. Here is the Pennsylvania bittercress popping up probably from seeds that were in the original potting soil around it. At one time in our history, plants like this were eaten by everyone. We're in a cultural period now where most people don't eat at things unless they find it in their grocery store. But every part of this plant is edible. The flowers, the seeds, the leaves. It can be used as a flavoring in salads. You could eat this as a salad itself. Its root can actually be harvested, ground up, and made into a condiment as a, either a horseradish substitute or a horseradish-like condiment in itself. Early settlers would have used this plant as they came out of their winter where they ate dried beans, dried meats, because they didn't have refrigeration, they didn't have grocery stores they could go to, they didn't have oranges for vitamin C, they got their vitamin C in the springtime from so many of these plants that are in your yards that we call weeds. So I'm gonna do a series and look at some of these plants that we refer to as weeds and help you identify them and learn about their historical histories. I'm a science guy, I'm a biology teacher, I'm not really a practicing herbalist or, or forager. So I'll tell you about these histories, that there's other channels that are address the edibility of these plants and how to harvest them, how to prepare them, when to eat them. I'm just gonna point out to you the benefits of these plants, how they're used historically. These seed pods will dry out later and they're the type of pods that when they're touched, they'll open almost explosively and throw their seeds everywhere. So people that actually try to weed these things by pulling the plants up later in the year will actually help spread their seeds because every time they touch the plant, the seed pods will explode. Apparently these seeds are good stir-fried, pickled, or just eaten raw. So many, many plants in your lawn are non-native plants. And even your grass, you know, which uh, in this area is tall fescue, that's a non-native. Our native grasses were things like big blue stem, little blue stem, switchgrass, Indian grasses. They were prairie grasses, which don't do well under a lawnmower. But this particular plant is actually a native species. And just a little aside on the biology of these plants. It's a cloudy day here, and you can see the ground is wet. A lot of flowers won't open if it's cloudy because they don't want to waste any of those resources if pollinators are not out and active. But this is when I wanted to do my photography. So I put a lamp here to see if I put a light on these plants, if I could get the flowers to open so I could take photographs of them. And in fact, it worked. These tiny white flowers are opening. You're gonna see these pictures here throughout the video. So thanks for watching this episode of Nature at Your Door. And again, the purpose of this series that I'm gonna do on plants in your yard is for you to look at these things that we call weeds with a different regard and understand that each one has a name, a particular biology, and almost all of them had uses to the early settlers. And many of them, the non-native species, were brought here by the early settlers for the use in their medicinal, in their kitchen gardens. Many of these native plants were used by the indigenous peoples of the Americas. And of course, please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already and leave me a comment or a question. I love hearing from my viewers. It's what really drives me to do this. And I'll answer your questions almost the same day. I always look at my YouTube to check to see if anybody's left me a question. I really love answering questions from you. But thanks for watching Nature at Your Door.